Hello, friends. This is Kim Freer, and I'm the host of, I think, the best radio show ever, Kim for Her Radio, Women's Hot Topics. And you know why I think it's the best show ever? Because we've got an amazing guest with us today. I'm super pumped. As soon as I saw her book was coming out, I had to get her on the show. And for some odd and strange reasons, she said yes. So ladies, <laughs> we're in for such a treat today. Today, I have Christy Wright. And she wrote a book called Take Back Your Time. Hey, John, are you with me? I am with you, Shug. I think, John, you and I need this book more than you. <laughs> you were talking about it before. You said, I think I need this book more than my listeners. I thought, no, I think I need it more than your listeners, Shug. <laughs> I, think so. I think so. It's called <laughs> Take Back Your Time, The Guilt-Free Guide to a Life Balance. And it's with Christy Wright. And she's with Ramsey Solutions. Christy, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh my gosh. Thanks for having me. You're right. This is a hard thing. That's why I wanted to write about it because I need it for my own life. So I get it. Yeah. I mean, we all do. So, um, you know, what I'm really super excited about was in the very beginning, you did a beautiful tribute to your husband. Um, and the bio was absolutely great in the forefront where you said, you know, he's just, you're everything. And right away, even before I turned the next page, I'm like, I love this woman. I love your <laughs> husband. I'd love to meet him sometime. It, it sounds like a gem. He's a saint. <laughs> so, yeah. What would we do without our husbands? Now, I just can't believe that you're able to have, I believe you have three children. Is that right? That's right. And they're under what age? Six, four, and one. <laughs> and then you work full time for Ramsey Solutions. And you wrote not, this is not your first book, is it? It's not. I, um, I have another book, Business Boutique, all about helping women start side businesses. But you know what's interesting, Shug, is in 10 years of doing business coaching, the number one question I was asked was not a business question. It was this question. How do you balance it all? How do you balance everything? And so it made me realize, man, this is a real pain point for people. And then to your point, I started having kids and working and doing all the things. I've got a lot of interests like so many women do. And um, it made me want to really dive into this topic and, uh, and get to the root of what's going on. You know what I love? I did read the book and uh, thank you for sending it to me ahead of time. Um, I read it. And as I was reading it, I was loving the stories, the way you write is so humorous. And then you really get to the, I mean, get to the heart of it. There's nothing fake about it. And could you just briefly share with us, you did just for a second there, a little bit more about why you wrote the book and how is it laid out? Yes. Well, here's the thing with this term life balance or balance. It's, it's interesting, Shug, because we ask about this all the time. How do you balance it all? How do you balance everything? I just need more balance in my life. And what I've realized is that when we talk about the question, we always talk about it as if balance is a verb. How do you balance it all? We have these ideas in our head that it's going to be this scale and everything's equally weighted. We've got all the analogies, walking a tightrope, spinning plates, juggling balls, which balls are glass, which balls are rubber, which ones can you drop <laughs> on a Tuesday? And the truth is, if you think about any of those images, that sounds stressful. Have you ever seen a tightrope walker? Like every fiber of their body is tense. Yeah. This feels hard. It feels risky. And most of all, it feels like I could do all that. I could try to have a 50-50 split and do everything for an equal amount of time and juggle all the balls and spin all the plates and walk the tightrope. And I could still feel as if something's not right. Mm. And so it led me down this path of asking a different question. What if balance isn't so much something you do, how you balance it all, what if it's something that you create in your life? What if it's something you become where you could be balanced and still be busy, where you could be balanced in an out of balance world where balance looks more like peace in a chaotic world, being confident when you say yes to this thing or no to that thing, being proud of how you spend your time for once in your life mm -hmm. and maybe just enjoying your life. I think when we ask about balance, that's what we're really after. And so I wanted to redefine balance in this book and say, life balance is not doing everything for an equal amount of time. We've tried that. It hasn't worked. Instead, life balance comes from doing the right things at the right time. And you get to decide what's right for you. So when you do the right things at the right time, you will actually feel that sense of balance that you've been looking for all along. And so I really wanted to reclaim this word, redefine this word, and then lay out very tactical steps to help people create this in their life. 
Well, you know, and that's just so powerful, especially to our listeners, uh, who the majority are women, but we do have men that listen as well. And they all have little babies like you do, or their midlife, or, or they have grandparents, and they're trying, you know, there's different generations that this really speaks to, which I really appreciated. Uh, my husband and I have just decided to sell everything, oh, sell, wow. our, sell our furniture, get on the road and bring the radio on the road. And so that's what we're doing today. Um, I'm hearing out of uh, Wisconsin right now, uh, go cheese heads. But Christy, I got to tell you, this book really spoke to me. And you talk about in the beginning, how important it was uh, when you had a new baby that you heard the words, you are doing a good job. Would you yeah. tell me why that was so impactful? Yeah, it's interesting because I think that sometimes we get an idea in our head and culture reinforces it. And uh, we might even have a bent towards this of focusing on the negative where we perceive that we're failing. We have, you know, we can talk about this later, but we have 50 things on our to-do list. We get 47 done and we beat ourselves up for the three we didn't get to. And we just have this narrative that we're failing all the time. And especially in motherhood when there's no handbook for that and you've got a million models of what a perfect parent looks like on Instagram and you're not that and your kids aren't that cute or well-behaved or married <laughs> matching outfits. And so we just walk around all day beating ourselves up and feeling like we're failing. And and so um, the, the story that I tell was when I was, um, you know, had a newborn. Carter was my my first child and it was about, I don't know, six or eight weeks into ha having him. And and we couldn't, I couldn't get him a nurse and he wasn't sleeping and he had infections. It was just, it was just really, really, really hard. And I remember crying one night in the nursery and my husband rushed in the room because he heard me crying with my son and he realized we were safe and fine, but he just stood in the, in the door and he just said those five words. He said, you're doing a good job. Mm. You're doing a good job. You are doing a good job. And the reason that was so powerful, and I want to make sure people don't miss this, that was not a compliment. If he was giving me a compliment, it would be like, you're doing awesome. Yay. Rah, rah. It wasn't a compliment. He was speaking truth into my heart and into my mind. He was speaking truth. And the only way to cut through the lies I had been believing, like I'm not doing a good job, is with the truth. Mm -hmm. In the same words, you're doing a good job. And so I just, one of the, the heart behind this book is not so much about the calendar and time management. It's about enjoying the life that the calendar represents. And I believe that there are men and women, but especially women, primarily women, walking around all day, every day, feeling like they're failing and they're not. Mm -hmm. And I want to help them see what a good job they're already doing and build on that and help them have some, some best practices for spending their life on what matters most to them. I love that. And I love just your heart and your passion. And listeners, if you're not familiar with Christy Wright, you've got to look her up, friends. Uh, you can find her at her own website, which is christywright.com, or you can find her on ramseysolutions.com. And what she does is that she goes around to sell out audiences, uh, motivating them, encouraging them uh, in Christ, uh, in their lives. And the Business Boutique was just a great kickoff, uh, just a wonderful book. And then to write this book, because it's on your heart to help other people, because you're walking it, you're experiencing it. I thank you so much, Christy. It was really meaningful to me. Thank you. Yeah. So you talk about five steps. Decide what matters. Because, you know, women that are listening right now, you've got, you're juggling so many it things. It all matters. It all, all matters. matters. They all do. And it's like, <laughs> I'm sorry, Christy, I just can't get rid of one thing because every one of them is so important. How do no. you decide? Yeah. Well, you're, you're right in that it's a struggle and it's hard. We have a lot of interests. We have a lot going on. And yes, we do have a lot of responsibilities. If you have kids, Kids bring with them so many responsibilities, not just the keeping them alive and feeding them, but, but schools and checklists and PTA meetings and all the things. So one of the things that we struggle with, women in particular struggle with this, is prioritizing. So for us, everything is created equal. Even when we rattle off our to-do list to each other, you can hear it in the way that we treat everything equally. Like, well, yeah, I mean, I've got to work out and I've got to pay my bills and I've got to reorganize my attic and I've got to steam clean the couch cushions. I need to feed my kids. And also, um, I also, also have to bake homemade cookies for everyone in the neighborhood. Okay. All that was not created equal. There are things you have to do. Feed your kids, pay your bills. There are things that would be nice to do. Work out. There are things that you don't have to do at all like steam clean your couch cushions, reorganize your attic or home bake cookies for everyone in the neighborhood. And until we learn the skill of prioritizing, we will always be overwhelmed. 
we will always be exhausted and we will be living in a lie that everything is treated equal and it's not. And so what I what I want to help people do is when, when, when we talk about doing the right things at the right time, I break it down into five tactical steps and I actually walk you through how to prioritize. But the very first step is decide what matters. Mm-hmm. What that means is what makes the cut? What makes it above the line? Your time is finite. Everything can't make it above the line. So what is most important and what is optional or not as important? And you're going to list things that you have to do, want to do, whatever, in order of priority, first, second, third, and so on. And then what happens is in this process of prioritizing is that you now have clarity about what's most important and what matters so that you can do it. And then when things fall below the line, because they can and they will, you don't have to feel guilty about that because the things that fell below the line were the right things. You're not steam cleaning the couch cushions and your kids haven't eaten in a day. Yeah. You're able to bring clarity to what matters. And, and I think one of the real struggles we experience, women are, are certainly bad about this because we're not willing to prioritize. We think the solution is just to work harder. We just need to work harder. Let's I know I need to wake up earlier. I need to wake up earlier. I need a better morning routine. I need, I need a new time management app. I need to multitask. I need to be more efficient, more productive. If I could just be more efficient, work, work smarter, not harder. Work smarter and harder and stay up later. If I could do that, I'd get it all done. No, you can't. No, you won't. All that's happened now is you have rushed through your day. You have not enjoyed your day because you're rushing through it. And by the way, we're usually the worst version of ourselves when we're rushing. We're impatient, short-tempered, not any fun, stressed, anxious, exhausted, etc. So you've rushed through your day, been the worst version of yourself, and you crash into bed at night, at night exhausted, exhausted. I think we all and, can relate to that. And still beating yourself up for the things you didn't get to. Amen. Yeah. So we have got to do something different. We have tried that. It has not worked. We need to try something different. We need to decide what is important and do that. Decide what matters and do that and choose what we're going to let go. I use the analogy in the book of my house because I love visual examples. So this this may sound silly, but truly, Shug, I can't keep my whole house clean at one time. It's not that big. I just have three kids that mess up faster than I can clean. (laughs) If I was going to do that, I would have to send them away to boarding school bring in some house cleaners, then maybe we could get it done, but it still, it wouldn't stay that way. So, so because I've realized this new reality of three kids under age six, I've decided what I'm going to fight for and what I'm going to let go. So essentially what makes it above the line and what is going to fall below the line that I'm not going to beat myself up for. I'm actually choosing that no. So for me, the kitchen, the living room and my bedroom are the rooms I spend the most, most time in. They're important to me. I fight to keep them clean and I do. You know, and I like that word that you use, Christy, is choose. I choose to keep it clean. You talked about the playroom in the book. And the playroom is a mess, but I have chosen to allow it to be a mess because I have prioritized other items in my life. I thought that was really powerful. Exactly. So there's the visual, the playroom and the boys' room and the deck. Don't make it above the line. So actually choose that no. So when I walk in the playroom and it's a mess, I don't think, oh, I'm such a failure. I need to clean the playroom, which is going to turn into a mess three seconds later. I look at that and I say... Oh, that no is a yes better spent somewhere else. So in my evenings, I'm playing with my kids. I'm not cleaning up after them. And so because we have a bent towards the negative, we need to shift that and train ourselves to focus on the positive. What are these no's allowing us to say yes to? Let's not focus on what falls below the line. Let's focus on what we are accomplishing, where we are succeeding, what we are getting done, what we are fighting for that falls above the line and be proud of that. And I think if we can do that, it's going to drastically change how we experience our life because we, we shake the guilt. And we finally, for once and for all, can feel proud of how we spend our time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you said in the book, more uh, it, time is not the answer. And then you give us an illustration. It was so cute about a doctor appointment for your child where you thought he was teething, but instead yep. it was something else. Can you tell us about that? Yes. So um, when Carter was around, I don't know, maybe a year old or so, he was teething and, and his gums were really bothering him. And there was, there was several days and nights where he's just like screaming bloody murder. And I am trying everything. We've tried ibuprofen. We have tried the, the gum ointment. We've tried frozen washcloths in his mouth. We tried everything. And he still is screaming his head off. Well, finally, after like three days, I take him to the doctor and the doctor takes one look in his ears and says, oh, he has an ear infection. I was like, oh, right, sure, sure. Of course, you're feeling like the worst mom ever. 
I'm like, my son was probably wondering why I'm shoving frozen washcloths in his mouth when it was his ears, not his teeth that were the problem. But when you don't know what the problem is, you can't fix it. And so I want to help people in this book understand what the real problem with our guilt and our lack of balance and even how we manage our time so that we can fix it. Because if we think the solution is just to work harder, wake up earlier and be more productive in between, we're still going to end up out of balance, but now we're exhausted. So I want to help you figure out the root cause and solve it there. I love that. I, and you know, you're just right on. I think all of us as, as moms have concentrated on the wrong thing or prioritize the wrong thing, just like that doctor's appointment. Uh, and then when you stand back and take a look at it, it's kind of humorous as to the direction of the time that you wasted on that. Yeah. So you talked about um, in your book, get it out of your head list. what do you mean? Yeah. By that? Well, I have a lot of ideas. Like I, I have a ton of ideas that will pop in my head. Like, Oh, I could bake homemade cookies for everyone in the neighborhood. But what starts as an idea of like, I could do that without me realizing it turns into, I should do that. And then I'm stressing out about getting all the ingredients for making homemade cookies for everyone in the neighborhood. You know, I'll give you an example. I was talking to one of my very best girlfriends, um, Jenny, uh, several weeks ago. And she was telling me, she, we, we send video messages back and forth on Marco Polo. And she said on her message to me, yeah, my kids are back in school. She's been a stay at home mom. Her kids are back in school. They'd been back in school like a day. Okay. They haven't been back in school very long. She's like, and I told myself when they went back to school, I was going to go back to work part-time. So I'm working on my resume and LinkedIn and, and careerbuilder.com. I mean, she is a anxious mess. Like she's just so overwhelmed. You can hear it in her voice. And she's, I'm just so overwhelmed, da, 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 all this stuff. So I sent her a Marco Polo message back and I am, we are best friends, but I'm also like, you're about to get coach Christy all up in your face. And I said, listen, you decided that you were going to go back to work when your kids were back to school you can just decide not to. Yeah. You're the one that decided that you're the one that put that pressure on yourself. You can just decide to take it off. And so I think that we need to remember that we are the ones in control of our calendar and our to-do list. And more often than we're willing to admit, we're in control of the pressure we feel. Mm -hmm. We actually put that pressure on ourselves or we allow it from outside sources. And so you need to, and I talk about this in prioritizing the book, Think about your season, what's most important this season. And we can dig into this if you want to yes. Think about your week, what, what's most important this week and even each day. Okay. What, what's top priority today? Like if I get nothing else done, I want to get this done. Mm -hmm. But then for all those ideas that pop in your head, like home baking, you know, making homemade cookies for the whole neighborhood. You know, that never occurs to me, by the way, just that comment <laughs> to make what? for the whole neighborhood. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or I've got to get, you know, a homemade invitation or, or handmade invitations or monogrammed outfits for, or even or even the things that pop on your kid's calendar. Like I just got the back to school calendar for both of my boys and everything in me felt like I needed to react to that. Like I go put all those things on my account. I don't have to do those. I can, if I want to, but I don't have to, I don't have to attend the parent coffee at 8 a.m. I don't have to, no one's got a gun to my head. <laughs> I am in control of my schedule. And so I think there's, there's an element of this, of figuring out what's most important in your season, in your week, in your day. And then all those other ideas that just pop in your head, whatever they may be, they're not most important. You can capture them on a, like, on a list of things I'll do if I have time to, if I, well, you know, I could do if I, if I want to, but it's not something you're going to put pressure on yourself and feel like a failure. If you don't do it, it was always optional. And so it gives you the freedom to let those things go. I believe this probably takes practice because a lot of the women I talk to, you know, they just say, my life is crazy. I don't know which side is up, which side's down. And then the young mothers, they show up at these events that I speak at and they're looking all perfect. And I'm like, ladies, you got to come show up with a little spit up on you or something. Yeah. Like, oh, we know that you are busy at home, but women, it's that comparison kills thing, especially on social media. Yes. The, the pressure for our generation of mothers is unlike anything any generation of mothers has ever had. And if we're going to have this force, this strong, strong current from social media, from, from just the media, from, from friends, peer groups, whatever, we're going to need a defense plan and, to your point, regular practice to combat that. Um, I, I'm a pretty confident person, and I teach the stuff, and I live it out, and still it's a daily rhythm of going, okay, what's right for me? Just because that's right for everybody else doesn't mean it's right for me. What's right for me? What does success look like for Christy in my life, in my family today? And then it doesn't mean that when you come up against people doing something differently, you don't still have those 
voices creep in of self-doubt because you do. I'll give you an example. I went to one of my kids' events a couple of weeks ago. This is so stupid. I, even as you look at it, you're like, this is so dumb. But all the moms were over here doing this. And I wanted to be over here with my kids, like in the activity. And I did. And I played with my kids and I was having a blast. And as I drove home, I just, I kept thinking like, did I do, was I supposed to be, is that what moms do? Like they, they, they huddle up over there and do that. There was like this pressure. There's, the, there's a the peer pressure. And so I just want to encourage people that if you feel that that's normal, but it's that much more important to practice and reassess what's right for me. And I went back to, I was like, who do I want to be? Okay. And I talk about this in the book. Who do you want to be? Who do I want to be? I want to be a fun, active, engaged, participative mom. Yeah. I'm not an observer. That's not who I am. That's not the type of mom I am. So I'm like, oh, that's who I want to be. And that's exactly what I did. I acted in line with who I want to be. In fact, I probably would have felt that guilt had I done what all the moms were doing and drove home. And I was like, I wasn't true to myself Mm -hmm. because while that's right for them, it's not right for me. And so it's a constant assessment of bringing yourself back to what's right for me. What does God have for me? Who did God design me to be? What are my values? What are my priorities? What's right right now for me? And the more you can train yourself to re- assess that, reassess that, refocus on that, it'll give you that confidence to be able to withstand that peer pressure and that comparison you're talking about. Amen. Amen. And it takes practice, friends. Okay. And you know, that's the key to the book. And I can't say the title of the book enough. Take back your time. Ladies, in order to take back your time, this next question I have for Christy is very important. And that is, what about downtime for mom? Mm. Well, a couple things. In light of your last question, it will look different for everyone. So know that just because one mom does self-care or time alone this way doesn't mean that that has to be right for you. So you figure out what works for you in the rhythms of your life. I was just talking about this recently, but for me, I don't have a Sabbath day, like Sunday where I do nothing. Cause I have three kids under age five. Like their work is a vacation compared to them. Okay. <laughs> so like that's, that's not, that's not happening in my life, but on Thursdays, Thursdays are my writing day. And so what I'll do is I'll go to a coffee shop. Not, not so much in this season, but in, in normal world when I'm not launching it, but I'll go to a coffee shop and I will just be alone and quiet. Mm-hmm. And I've realized that the two things I need in order to feel rest, rejuvenated, renewed, exactly like you're talking about downtime, you know, is I don't have to be doing nothing. That's fine. I mean, I can, but, but for me, it's not that two things. I need a lack of noise. There's just so much noise. (laughs) Three kids, man, so much noise all the time. I need no noise. I need quiet and I need not to perform. And it's not like I'm performing, like I'm a different person for you than I am in real life. But when you're on camera, when you're having conversations, when you're engaging with people, you're on, like you're smiling, your face, like you're so, and you're so engaged because it's fun and it's awesome. But like, for example, I went to um, uh, Florida with my husband, Matt and April and Shug the first two days, he asked me probably 25 to 40 times, are you okay? Are you okay? Because I didn't smile at all. And it wasn't that I wasn't having fun. I was like, I just need my face to rest. <laughs> like, yeah. like, and you know this from being on camera, but you're just, when you're on in meeting, even if you're in meetings or talking to people, we're so expressive and engaged. I was yeah. like, I just need a day where I can have greasy hair, no makeup. No makeup. I can not smile and it's not going to hurt someone's feelings and just have some quiet. And so that for me is rest. And so I think for, for someone else, it might look totally different and, and that's okay. I think you need to figure out what makes you feel renewed. And, and another thing for me is workouts. You know, I love, that gives me energy. I love working out, figuring out what is that for you and then incorporating it into your life in a way that works for you and and knowing it doesn't have to look like anyone else and you don't have to feel guilty when it doesn't, Mm -hmm. but prioritizing time to be renewed is essential for you to have energy for these things that you want to do. Amen. And I love the way that you said, put it on your calendar. Put your downtime on your calendar. Yep. Uh, you know, make a point of finding time for yourself so that you can recharge. And ladies, there's nothing better than personal quality time with the Lord. You get a couple minutes, to sit down, just be with God, pray, open up, read His Word. And it's amazing how quickly you will be rejuvenated. So ladies, thank you very much, Christy Wright, for coming on. Would you find her book, please, Take Back Your Time?